<laughs> Hello. Hey. Hello. Are you hearing and seeing? I didn't have to press any buttons or anything. No, that's it. I can see your lovely face. Hello. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. <laughs> How are you? Hello. I'm very well. How are you, how are you there? I'm doing I'm well. Okay. I'm all right. In lockdown madness, but it's all okay. Are you sort of locked Nothing. It's all the same for me. Nothing has changed, really. Right. Are you keeping well? I, I sit at home all the time anyway, Lindsay, you know. <laughs> so do I. When I, I go, when I go shopping, I wear a mask now. That's, that's you know, that's all. That's, that's standard now, so. Yeah. One is so used to it. That's the way it's always going to be, I guess. You know. I think it will be for a, for a while. Yeah. The latest kind of fashion yeah. is what's my mask look like? Does it match my hair? <laughs> well, come on now. I have a whole variety of them. Yeah. I have some with funny funny faces on them. I have some that were made by friends. I have some that my doctor gave me. I have all kinds. There's just the whole there's a whole drawer full over here. Six of them in my car in case I forget one at home. You know. Same, carry one same. in my pocket okay. hang hang one on the mirror in my car so i don't forget it you know yeah because you might you might walk like 50 paces to get to the shop you're going to they think oh shit yeah then you got to go back you got to go back and get it again you know i do it all the time i'm always going to the shop and i'm like oh <laughs> yeah like, yeah How then somebody you... just points at you they go yeah. like that you know yeah yeah okay how's lynn doing so well? great she's doing great <laughs> <laughs> she's working away, you know, she's uh, trying to get herself ready for uh, what she hopes will be, you know, an Easter show, okay. <clears throat> which is kind of an annual event for her. She'll do it by, I guess, by invitation, you know, only yeah. because people come and they'll just come individually and look at her work. She did very well around Christmas time, the last show she did. Oh, <clears throat> so she's in, she's in her studio all the time. The wall is full of beautiful, beautiful stuff now. I'll have to send you some pictures sometime. Yeah, do so. Give her a big squeeze from me. Give her my love. Yes, yes, of course Ooh. I will. She, she sends one to you too, by the way. Oh, I, I receive it gratefully. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> cool, yeah. can we crack on them? So. All right, let's, let's go watch. here. What's going on? Let's <clears> talk so, a little bit about know. you. First of all, <clears> thank you for taking the time to do this, Ken. I really appreciate it. It's a great. Oh, yeah. It. yeah. Uh, so let's <clears> talk a bit about uh, your start in acting. So for you, was acting a kind of vocation, like when you were younger, or is it something that you sort of discovered a little bit, sort of as a young adult? Well, it's a, it's a very long story, but not that long. I mean, I think when I was a kid, I was a bit of a show off in in the class, right? I remember one of my first report cards said, "Kenneth has got to settle down and stop disturbing the class." So they they moved me up into the next grade to get rid of me. Right. And then I remember, like, I used to entertain my relatives at home, my uncles and aunts, you know. I'd imitate Elvis when I was in my early teens. I mean, I just, it was all this kind of, I was a bit of a, you know, a player. I guess I, I enjoyed, you know, I guess what we call showing off in those days. Right. But then, okay, I was in... Um, I was about to go into my, into grade 11. I, I just had... Uh, uh, I had this girlfriend who just broke up with me, uh, Carol, and she said, uh, you know, you should take the, the drama course. She said, it's a real snap. She said, it's a real easy course. I can, I can sell you the textbook at half price. So I thought, what the hell, you know? So I, I took this drama course <clears throat> in grade 11. It happened that it happened that the teacher was so into like really interesting plays. Uh, we did this play called The Yellow Jacket, the Chinese play, and then we did something which was a German expressionist play called No More Peace, wow. in which we got to wear masks and padding and all other kinds of things. And I thought this looks like fun, you know. So uh, I don't know when it time. That's how I got. And then I suddenly got this like feeling about it. And I when I was it came time for me to choose what I was going to study at the university, you know, in my, in my hometown of Edmonton, Alberta, uh, you know, they sent around this form and on this form, it showed your various faculties at the university you could choose. And I always thought I would like go into engineering or something because my, my marks in science were my best marks, you know, like physics and chemistry and trigonometry and all that stuff. And then it came around, I turned the page and there was this like bachelor of arts and drama. I looked at it and I went, uh, 
Yeah. I checked that off. That was it. Yeah. It is definitely a feeling, isn't it? I knew from a young age that I wanted to act and it's never, ever gone away. That bug has never left. Ever. No, exactly. As soon as I actually, the first play, let's see, it was um, this play called Yellow Jacket, which I was the fourth assistant property man. I had no lines, really. Uh, and I just moved props around and put bridges up and things. And uh, after, and I would throw fake snow on the, on these, on the young lovers and all that. And I got my first laugh and I believe that was it. Yeah. As soon as I, I, as I heard the audience laugh at something I did, I thought something stirred within, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I completely understand it. I still remember yeah. I was on stage as a young girl and basically hearing the reaction for the audience and knowing that you did that, it's the biggest buzz and that you've sent them away with a smile on their face. It's such an incredible rush. Yes, I, I had no idea, you know, whether they were smiling or not, but I sure was. Yeah. And then throughout my career, I always thereafter, I, I always loved doing comedies best or trying to make something funny, even if it wasn't. Yeah. Like when I played Macbeth, I tried to get laughs. Failed. I know. Apparently Peter O'Toole got lots of laughs when he did it, but I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, I imagine, actually. So let's just touch a little bit on your training there, because you went to the University of Alberta and then you went to the National Theatre School in Montreal. So yeah. with that, com that combined training, and I believe you studied Stanislavski as well, do you feel that that gave you the right kind of tools to enter out into the world of unemployed actor? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, first of all, the training I got at the University of Alberta was the Stanislavski training. Yes because there, there happened to be this professor there called Gordon Peacock, who was trained in, uh, in teaching the method. And it's very hard to do. Not many people can really teach it. They can pretend that they can teach it. But Gordon had the ability, when we were doing an improv or a scene or anything, uh, he could look at it and recognize when you were being truthful and when you weren't. And he would be able to pinpoint exactly that moment was true, that was not. And that's the whole point of it. I mean, the Stanislavski system is based on truth in acting, right? Yeah. And bringing a real character to life. And yeah. so Gordon was so expert at this. And I felt like I, that was inside of me. That was this part was ready to go. And, uh, you know, I had developed other skills as well, but I thought there was this new school in Montreal called the National Theatre School. It had been in existence for like two years this time in 1962. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to spend my life as an actor, which I had already planned to do, I thought that I had better get as much training as I felt I would need before entering into the profession. Right? So I went to the NTS, which was a total kind of different world. It was a world of, you know, uh, gymnastics and uh, speech training and uh, movement training and uh, and doing you know, some classical theater, you know, a bit of Shakespeare. So I first, uh, not the first time I encountered Under Milk with Dylan Thomas's play, but uh, one of the first times I did it. So I had a whole different kind of physical training there. And I met, I had like the probably the, the best voice uh, and text teacher anywhere, uh, Eleanor Stewart, who taught you know, uh, other like famous Canadian actors like Chris Plummer and uh, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, you know, a Star Trek, uh, you know, thing. Uh, you know what I mean, the original Star Trek guy. Right, William Shatner. Yeah, Shatner, yeah. Shatner. I think it was TJ Hooker. <laughs> there you go. No, no. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so it was, um, the time, and also, I mean, frankly, uh, they brought in uh, directors to work, you know, to teach us, do plays with us, who, uh, you know, then would maybe give you a chance when you got out of school to audition for them or, you know, get you cast in something. Like uh, John Hirsch came to uh, to work with us, and even though he, he, he thought we'd all never be actors, I auditioned for him at Stratford, and John remembered me from the school and like two years after I was at Stratford I was playing Hamlet wow. you know and other directors that came to teach us you know had theaters across Canada and, and you know when you're in the off season or when you're looking for work you know they would think oh yeah I remember him from the theater school uh, and they would give you 
you know, this opportunity to, to work on play here in Winnipeg or in Vancouver or Calgary or wherever it was, you know. So it was very valuable from many points of view of that place. Yeah. Well, speaking of your Shakespeare, I mean, I, I've seen you do Shakespeare online and I was witness to it when um, you came to London and you'd often quote Shakespeare and think when we were talking, things like that. So I know it is a love of yours. Now, yes. did, that, did that stem from the training or did it stem from the fact that for your first few years of your career, you were at the Stratford Festival in Ontario for a long time? No? No. No, this, this love of Shakespeare started, uh, actually, here you go. It was another teacher. It's always a teacher, you see. Yeah, There's always a teacher true. somewhere. Yeah. This, this was in, in, in grade 12, and it was Miss Malloy. And we were studying Hamlet. And she said, this play and all of Shakespeare's plays were intended uh, to be heard, to be read, to be performed, not to be read as a, as a piece of literature, but to be, be heard and seen. Yeah. And so uh, this... I don't know, I thought, wow. And I began to go to the library in, in my hometown, the Edmonton Public Library, and they had this big collection of plays on record, you know, on LP. Yeah. And I would get, every week I would go and get something, always, always from Britain. Uh, I, I remember one of my favorites was, uh, was A Midsummer Night's Dream with uh, Stanley Holloway playing Bottom. I think it was the, the Royal Vic Company. And uh, I, I just, I was, I so fell in love with it. The way, the way that Shakespeare was spoken by these wonderful actors. And it was all so funny and everything. You know, I thought, this is great stuff. You know, so I'd never seen it. I mean, I'd been in a, in a Shakespeare production when I was at a place called the Banff School of Fine Arts, but uh, that also kind of, you know, that was it, while I was in the midst of all this. I mean, g getting these records and performing uh, Shakespeare at, at the Summer Theater when I was like 17, 16. Um, got me going. I, I just never stopped loving it, you know, after that. And I would, as I say, the library there just, just constantly uh, provided me with these, uh, these long playing, you know, uh, the, the LPs of these plays. I loved it. Yeah, I'm a big Shakespeare fan myself. I've actually worked with the Royal Shakespeare Company, but not in an acting sense. I helped project manager the 2008 history season uh, at the wow. Roundhouse, the venue I was running at the time. And that was where I met David Warner, actually, who came to the... Oh, Bush David, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In 2019. So, uh, so yeah. David I'm, and I, I believe David, yes, I think we talked about it. We had a brief conversation with him when we had the festival there. Yeah. And I believe that David and I played Hamlet at the same time. Oh, really? He was playing it, yeah, he was playing it in London, I think, when I was playing it at Stratford in 1969. Wow. That's which amazing. was a very, a very key time and year to be playing that role because, you know, it's such a relevant part for, for, for young audiences. And uh, there's a lot of kind of rev revolution going on at that time and yeah. young people's thinking. So anyway, yeah, yeah, David, yeah. Anyway, yes, yes, mm -hmm. Shakespeare. Mm, love so, it. Still I mean, do it. Your career, if I'm right in saying so, has spanned 50 years now? Probably more than that, Lindsay. Probably more like 57. Really? Incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. And I mean, yeah. from what I can see... And it's still see, going. I know, it's, it's crazy. Going. It's just too good. <laughs> um, from what I can see, like, you've kind of pretty much steadily been in work for most of that? I would say yeah. so, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. And you are quite well known for playing um, a few historical figures. You've played Harry S. Truman, Thomas Edison, Thomas E. Dewey. And what I wanted to sort of ask you about was whether you feel that there's a different approach to bringing a real life character back to life than there is when you're actually creating a character from scratch. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, let's see. I would say the, well, there's one thing that, you know, you, you, I would always go and find out as much as I could about the character. Right. And obviously there are, you know, volumes available on people like Harry Truman and, uh, you know, which I read a lot about. And then you try to bring whatever you think is relevant to the particular story you're telling about this person. And also you want to be like that person. You want to, you want to be, I mean, in that case, they made me up to look like him. And I found a little bit of, uh, you know, there's, a, there's some Truman voices around, you know, uh, and uh, 
the same with Edison. There are both, there are, you know, lots of, lots of bio, biographical material on both these guys. But you want to be careful when you're, you know, with Edison, it's, nobody really knows what he looked like, or really, you know. But so you can make what up, up, up whatever you want there. And uh, I kind of based it on Frank Morgan, which because I, this is like an aside. But Frank Morgan was like this kind of subconscious um, hero of mine. I guess when I saw uh, uh, Over the Rainbow, uh, uh, um, no, Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz, uh, I, I kind of became fascinated as a young, uh, as a kid with, with seeing this guy. And so I kind of based Edmund, Ed, Edison on him. But with Truman, you know, yeah, you got to be careful when you're, when you're uh, sort of, portraying the character that you don't make a caricature of it there's yeah. kind of a borderline i've seen it both ways in, in some performances where actors will go so far that they try to become the character and so you know you gotta like this is where my old training came in because i would then go to see what was his real motivation what was going on when he was thinking about when he inherited this this whole notion of dropping the a-bomb on japan which was completely out of his control, and how did he feel about that? And so you can, you really go to the inner side of the character rather than, you know, just portraying somebody who looks like this guy, like a portrait of Truman. That, that's, that's totally wrong. There was one really inst interesting situation I got into. I was offered this role in a, a Canadian uh, film uh, production. It was called, um, uh, oh, 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 it was about this, oh God, I was thinking about it a while ago. Uh, it was called uh, the Bruce Curtis story. It's about this young, it's a real story about this kid called Bruce Curtis who got involved with this friend of his uh, in the States. Uh, Bruce was from Nova Scotia. And uh, he got involved in accidentally in, in the murder of this other kid's parents. Wow. And he was convicted wow. of it. And I, got, I found out that the lawyer that I was playing, which was his defense lawyer, was in New Jersey. He was a lawyer in New Jersey still. And so I arranged to go meet him because I was in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I talked to him about the script and about the trial and about his involvement in it, what he thought about whether the kid was guilty or not. What, and, and, and then I showed him this speech. I said, this is a speech they've given me that they say you spoke at the trial. Would you please either have a look at that and tell me whether, and he said, mm, yeah, yeah, but, he said, they left something out. They left out some very important uh, information that was in that speech to the jury that he gave or to the judge. And I took it back to the director of the film. I said, this is what my friend the lawyer said. And he said, oh, well, I think we better put that in the script. So you see, it can have, if you can actually meet the person, what a difference it makes, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, in that case, I recorded him and did actually, you know, did his kind of New Jersey uh, dialect. That was fun because it was like this person I could actually meet yeah. and record his voice and record him speaking, uh, you know, uh, the text. Which is fantastic because so often when you're portraying real life characters, they've already passed away. But to actually have them still alive and talk to them and get their Absolutely. experience, their mannerisms. Well, there, there was another one. There was another guy I played who was still alive. He was in jail. His name was Colin Thatcher. Right. And he was convicted of, of brutally murdering his wife. He was a sort of politician out in Western Canada, right? Right. And is someone I did not want to meet. I mean, somebody said to me, Kenny, do you want to go and meet the guy? Maybe we could arrange like something in the prison. I said, ah, uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I think I'd rather read about him yeah. than meet him. Anyway, you know, so yeah, it's always, it's always something interesting about playing someone who's either still alive or was alive. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a fascinating thing. Uh, and even, well, it leads me into, uh, you know, creating a character like when I was doing this movie called Margaret's Museum, uh, a fabulous uh, a Canadian film with Helena Bonham Carter starred in it. And Helena oh, was so wonderful. Yeah. And uh, I was playing this character called Uncle Angus. And uh, it was like, uh, it's a very specific dialect in uh, Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. And when I went out there, I had the script, you know, and I went. They were already shooting and I was a few days in the, you know, ahead of when I was supposed to be on the set. And so I went to this, uh, went to the set and it was like this local store. 
I took the script into the store and I was at the guy who ran the store, the manager of the store. I said, would you mind reading these underlined lines for me that I could record them, you know, with your particular dialect? Sure, I can do that for you. So he did. I mean, and this is always fun to me. Yeah. That kind of exploration and when you can get it, you know, I, I always like to do the detailed like stuff like that because it's, if there's some, some detail to be had about a character, I'll go and look for it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Anyway, that's that's all about that. So <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. It's fascinating to hear all these stories and the people that you've played. It's wonderful. But of course, yeah. we can't chat without mentioning your most famous character, at least in in my world, I guess. Um, there and you go, mine too. Yeah, that's Wyndham Earl from Twin Peaks, and obviously it's through Wyndham that you and I know each other. And, yes. Uh, and. I'd like to talk a little bit about how that process of you becoming Wyndham and the character that you created and how much of your own personality, knowing you as I do, <laughs> is in Wyndham Earl, do you think? Well, okay, which, which part shall I start with? Like how, how it came about? Or... Yeah, why not, why not? Well, I was, yeah, I was in, um... Los Angeles shooting a TV movie, and uh, I was speaking with my ex-wife Donna, who's always been a great friend of mine. And she said, uh, "Ken, you know Bob Engels is is uh, is uh, writing for this new series called Twin Peaks." And Bob and Donna and I were together at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis in the early '70s, and then Bob got involved with this project. And she said, Kenny, why don't you just call him? See what's, see what's going on. Just, you know, call him up, see how he's doing. And so in the process of calling Bob, I said, you know, he said, Ken, I probably told you the story, but he said, Ken, you know, uh, I'm working on this series called Twin Peaks. He said, there's a character and this is, would be just right for you. Why don't you come out on the set and meet a few people? It was like that, okay? So <laughs> I drive out on whatever boulevard it was to the studio and, uh, I, you know, I met, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the co-producer, writer, uh, 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 Warren's son, you know. Oh, Mark, Mark Frost. <laughs> yeah, 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 Mark Frost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mark was there. Um, David Lynch was not there. I met a few other people around, you know, and then by the end of the hour, Bob said, well, can. Let's let's do it. You know, I said, what? <laughs> he says, yeah. You you know, we'll have your character will come on like in two weeks. So I went back home here, and uh, the next thing I know, I'm flying down to LA, and I'm doing this like once every ten days. I fly down and do an episode for like what? How many times was I in it? Eight times, nine? I don't know. Yeah. And so that's how it started. Just like this, you know, Donna saying, "Give Bob a call." You know, it's kind of very kind of Twin Peaksian, don't you think? Yeah, it's very quick. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa, that, whoa, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. it's obviously, they obviously saw something in you. And now that I know... Well, see, yeah, because Bob remembered, he knew me very well. You know, he said, Ken, is, he's like this kind of playful character. He's got this kind of, I don't know, classical theater thing going on too as well. And, uh, you know, I, it was, I guess, you know, that I was always like, uh, in a way I bro approached the character, I, I thought, yeah. It's, uh, you know, he likes to have, like, wouldn't it, even though he was like, basically, whoops, there you go. That's okay, sorry about that, Kim. No, that's all right, no. I mean, wouldn't it, I mean, it seems to be like this, he's the kind of evil character, you can't really help it, but on the one hand, what, what, what I could relate to it, and it was that, you know, I'd like to bring different, uh, different forms. I, I, I brought different uh, uh, accent, different characters to him as he was trying to, you know, entrap certain people or, or you know, pursue his uh, in his path of, of tracking of, of um, what would you say, you know, uh, uh, his mortal enemy. You know, yeah, yeah, uh, Carl. yeah. Dale Cooper. So, but anyway, um, now your que your question was. Uh, well, how did you get how, do, what, how much of you is in Wyndham? Yeah. Well, I'd say it was, as I said, I'd say that there's a playfulness that uh, I like to embody mm. in Wyndham, a kind of, and a humor, an edge of humor on something, an edge of like a kind of ironic twist on things, yeah. like a, 
and also, as I say, his ability to, you know, disguise himself into this this other kind of character so fully that he can have, he was actually kind of pleased and proud of himself, as I would be too. You know, yeah. I can like fool, fool you with, 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 you know, as I say, searching out and finding out different ways of presenting a character with dialects or movements or ways of speaking, you know. So, uh, yeah, it was like my own kind of crazy imagination as an actor that I like to explore, I think, that, that, was, uh, that brought me to this character in, 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 the, in the ways that I did. So, yeah, uh, you know, I don't relate, you know, to his evil side at all, of course. No, of course. No, no, <laughs> no. But the, no. the thing I was just about to say was even though Wyndham was evil, and he was brilliant and an evil genius almost. There was something really lovable about him as well. There was something, I know whether it was his theatricality or whether it was his humor, um, you know, that was yeah. something you brought to it, that people were almost slightly rooting for him a bit because he was really enthralling to watch. Well, you know, because that's what you, you know, as you know, that's what you do when you have a character that seems so like on the evil side, you try to find, you, you don't even, you don't think about that. You try to play the good side of it. You yeah. see his point of view. And when I saw his point of view, what I saw was a guy who had suffered. And he thought that, uh, you know, Kyle's character was the, you know, my mind's going all of a sudden. Dale Cooper. You know, Cooper, yeah. He yeah. thought that, you know, Cooper was responsible, you know, for, you know, the death of his wife and that he was having a or whatever. Yeah. I mean, he had this motivation that I felt was uh, quite strong, you know, and it was, it was, um, it was justifiable what he was doing mm. because he'd had, he'd had a hard life. He'd had, you know, it, 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 suddenly things happened to him that were out of his control and, uh, you know, they were, um, I don't know, caused him a lot of emotional pain. Yeah. And, and I he, wanted, he wanted to unravel that pain. Yeah. And so, you know, one way to do that was to, I don't know, put on a mask kind of like, and just try and hide it and go about his business of, of pursuing Cooper in, in whatever way he could, but, you know, in the kind of lightest way possible with a touch of, of uh, I don't know, of humor and irony and of a touch of, uh, I guess that's it, you know, just with uh, a it bit of fun. It was a game to him, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fun. It was a game to him. He enjoyed playing. A bit of fun. Yeah, a game, right. He enjoyed the game a, a yeah. lot. Indeed. And yeah. I think that's why the performance has become so legendary, let's face it, because you did play his truth. You understood him and you played his truth. And that's why... That's what I, I, I felt like that's what, that's what I was trying to do, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting and, because... Um, You've been quoted as saying, I believe it was with an interview with my good friend Martin Hearn, actually, um, that the other role that you enjoyed playing as much as Wyndham Earl was the recent role of Larry Loomis in Lodge. Yes, yes, I, I would say, yes. You know, I've, I've, I've enjoyed, well, I guess, most of the characters I've played, but these two, I guess, are in the same gallery, really. Yeah. That's why did, I, I enjoyed them in the same Wyndham, way. Yeah, did you draw on Wyndham's influence a little bit for Larry? I, yeah, I think so, because Larry was the same. Wyndham and Larry are both outsiders, right? Mm -hmm. They're outside looking in, and Larry had the same kind of, there was a background that he had. It involved his mother and how she left him and abandoned him and ran off with this other guy who happened to be head of the lodge and all this stuff that influenced him emotionally. In the same way, Larry turned this into a kind of craziness, you know? Mm -hmm. And his behavior was could be interpreted as like kind of slightly loony and you know just on the edge of of of, of humor and and sadness at the same time and like uh you know the relationship he had with uh with uh brent brent jennings's uh, character yeah uh ernie was uh, very very special to him uh like you know he had nobody in his life like Wyndham had nobody in his life really anymore except himself yeah. and so Larry was like a loner and he felt I think lonely so much and he had this like friendship with with Ernie that was all important to him and I just I loved playing and I loved the the way that he died it was so such a great ending yeah when he, he dies 
<laughs> he's sitting in his car and he sees this, this is the birdhouse. It, it was like a flashback to a birdhouse that was seen much earlier in the series. And the birdhouse has aged and there it's sitting in front of, hanging from this tree. And Larry's in the car and then Ernie and, um, and uh, uh, Wyatt Russell's character come along and they just look in and there's Larry just, and they pick the song, you know, the Nat Cole version of, uh, uh, there was a boy, a very strange, you know that song. Yeah. Enchanted boy. Anyway, so they were, yes, these two guys uh, kind of were related in my mind. I liked exploring. I like it when there's a, a kind of depth of loneliness in a character. I don't know why. Maybe I experienced that when I was younger. But I, that's what I see in these two guys mm. is this kind of interesting loneliness that is never really expressed except in being like a clown or being uh, someone who's a little bit of an oddball or someone who's outside of the society that they're living in and looking in on it with a kind of, you know, weird observation. So yeah, they were like in the same deck for me, these two guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I understand that I think, I've heard that Lodge 49 is now becoming kind of like a, a, a uh, the same kind of uh, series like with Twin Peaks. There's, there's this following going on now. Among oh, the following, right. <laughs> apparently. So. And now the one I'm doing is obvious also, apparently, has a bit of a cult following. The King of the, the Cult. <laughs> the series called Charmed. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Did you know I was doing this? No, I don't think I did, but is this the Charmed reboot? Of charms. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The one about, about the witches, the young yeah. witches. Yeah. Yeah. So and what I, I've done. In I, did, I did one episode. Okay. About a month ago, and now apparently they want me back again for another one, which is pretty rare, you know. Yeah. They, they didn't kill me off. That's what usually happens to me. I get killed off, <laughs> but not not in this case. No. So apparently they want me to come back at the end of this month to do it again. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. I love the character again. It's like this four hundred year old witch, you know, my kind of person, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, I get it. Well, let's yeah. talk a bit about your um, your stage work. And I, what I was I was really interested in when I was doing all the research for this was your work that you've done with Soul Pepper, and actually their work that they've done as a whole in Canada. They're the um, they're quite an in inclusive, artist driven community, it seems. And, and I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you got involved with them and your kind of feeling about whether or not community inclusion um, benefits the arts. Well, it's a difficult question, but how, how I got involved there, I hadn't been on stage for a number of years. I mean, since like 1996, I had, uh, I did a play at Lincoln Center. I did uh, Middle Foxes there and then jump ahead to say, uh, oh gosh, where are we now? 2000 and I have early 2000s, it was like six or seven years since I've been on stage anyway. Right. And I was approached by one of the members of this. It was like a, like a communal uh, theater that was founded by like eight people. Mm. In that sense, already it's part of a community because all these actors have come together from various places in the country, in the city of Toronto and formed this you know, theater company called Soul Pepper. And uh, they asked me to come in and do a play again by a, a Canadian playwright, uh, David French. And so right away, you know, I'm, I'm doing a play that comes out of a Canadian community of, of theater of writers. You know, David was a, from Newfoundland and quite well known in Canada as a playwright. And so I, I did several of his plays there and what and what by inclusivity i think maybe i guess the best example of that would be uh while i was doing my last piece of work though which i think is when i did a one-man show of under milkwood nice. at the same time there was an actor brilliant actor and writer called ince Choi, and ince had written uh a display called kim's convenience which was a kind of uh takeoff on the Korean community in Toronto. It's centering on, you know, this Kim's Convenience corner store, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, Ince wrote this play, which was first performed at Soul Pepper, and then extended into the larger community uh, of Toronto as, and Canada, in fact, 
as a very popular uh, award-winning series, which ran for seven or eight seasons. So by that, I mean, suddenly you had a, a glimpse of another aspect of the Canadian, uh, what, what would you call it, the, 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 the Canadian, uh, hmm, I don't know, S spread, you know, pop, uh, cultural spread. In this case, you know, a look at uh, a, a community you might not be aware of, the, 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 you know, the, the Korean uh, community represented in very uh, amusing and uh, kind of, uh, uh, very, how would I put it? A very particular look at, at this, this, you know, the, the Korean community within Canada through this series. And therefore, I mean, it, it, it started as Soul Pepper and expanded into this, like amazingly funny and popular series, which showed people a little bit about uh, some people they might not know anything about, you know, the yeah. Korean community of Canada, you know, so I thought that's, that's a good example of it, you know? Yeah, I just find, um, I find it so important to be inclusive with the arts and make it accessible to all walks of life. Um, and I think more and more that's becoming more available. I actually used to run a theatre company for disabled actors. And uh, ah. it's quite important of me to have, make sure everyone had the same opportunities and the same experience, no matter what their backgrounds, diverse backgrounds were, you know? Yeah, I've been watching, I've been, I've been watching uh, on, uh, I forget what the app is, but it shows me, um, you know, Shakespeare productions that are going on in, in London. Yeah. And what I see there is a lot more racial inclusivity. And I also actually saw a woman who was an amputee playing the role of, of, uh, of Nerissa in The Merchant of Venice. And I thought, yeah, you know, bring everybody in. And, and a lot of the cast, you know, were black actors. You never saw that when I was uh, doing Shakespeare at Stratford. I was thinking about this the other day. There was like w w no black actors in the entire seven seasons I was there. None. Okay. No. And now, you know, the doors are open now and, you know, cultural, uh, uh, well, I guess, you know, as, you, as you say, cultural inclusivity is now uh, a very strong uh, part of, 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 of the theater everywhere. But I, I'm very impressed with the plays I see, you know, like the, the cast of, and it's all, what was it, was it was, I think it was As You Like It or something, it was all female. Mm. There was a female Hamlet. I'm, I'm, I think, yeah, this works. Why not? Let's do it. Is that the Maxine you know. Peake one? She was amazing. What? Who's Ma that? Maxine Peake when she played Hamlet. Was that the there one? There you that go. Watched? Yeah, she's amazing. So yeah, throughout your whole career, Kev, TV and everything, do you still find that you revert back to the kind of original training and that original grounding that you had in you? Or do you feel that you've kind of moved away from that now? Oh, no, no, I, I still go to the same sources I've always uh, used, except I, I have a different experience now. So, you know, this is what we do. We, uh, well, actors put things away, as you know, right? You see, you feel something, you think, I'm going to keep that, I'll use it someday. I remember doing that when I was young. Oh, God, I just, somebody just hurt me. I'm going to keep that inside. Mm -hmm. Somebody just broke my heart. I'll use that someday, you know, and that, that you just keep building it up as you, as you go through your life. And so now I just draw on whatever experience I have. It's a lot easier for me now, though, to go out and I have, I have no, I, I don't usually, I don't get, uh, uh, sometimes I would, I would get kind of anxious about, you know, preparing for a role or doing it. But now I just, I just go and do it. Yeah. And I just draw on whatever's going on in my life and that's it. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I use the same sources as I always have. That's great. So the one thing I love about you, Ken, and the one thing that bowled me over when we actually physically met um, is your amazing energy and your zest for life. It's so wonderful. <laughs> what, where does that come from? What inspires you? How, how are you always like this? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess I, it's, it, 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 well, A, you know, when I go, well, like when I was in England at the festival, I, I feel like I'm surrounded by people that, you know, really love me. And I tend to, you know, like I said, my, my, my innate desire to show off comes out and I, it comes out in this kind of crazy energy that I, 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 might, I might be showing at that time. But I don't know, I guess, um, I don't know, I was inspired originally by, by my father, who was a very kind of a funny guy. He was always... He was very energetic and, and intelligent and funny person. And 
I don't know. Now, you know, I, there were times in my life when I went through, you know, some pretty serious and depressing uh, experiences, you know, and, and getting past that, realizing how valuable and wonderful that life can be if you're just trying to look for something that brings you outside of yourself. And, uh, you know, like I'm inspired by looking out my window now, seeing these bare trees in winter that will soon be bearing leaves. And I look at my cat in the window and think, my cat inspires my my lovely girlfriend Lynn inspires me with her art and with her love and my son Devin inspires me yeah with his talent and his his ability he to cope I mean he's a young man he's thirty two he's usually on tour singing uh, you know and doing doing his music and he's at home now with this lovely lady and he creates music at home he does poetry he works you know he's he's just he inspires me too with the kind of love and energy that he brings to his life and to mine. Yeah. And so I guess it's just looking, being, looking around and like that bird I see up there right now up in that branch. I always make sure my bird feeders are full so the little birds come around every day and I, I appreciate their being here. And I, th I guess it's a question of looking outward at things, you know, and saying, yeah. all right, this, this is my world. Like whatever I see, hear and feel is my world. Yeah. And the more you go out to something and reach for it and bring it into you, like there's the, okay, this is crazy. But when I'm in the bathtub, and outside my outside my window, this is a very old maple tree. It's much older than I am, by a little bit. It's like 180 years old. <laughs> but <laughs> and every time I'm lying in the tub, I look out at that tree, and I see it in different aspects every time, every season, every you know. I see it in the wind or not in the wind. I see it with leaves, without leaves. And I say, that tree has been solid for that length of time. It was here before this house was built. And this house is over 150 years old. And uh, I don't know. That's, it's, I don't know. It's the, outside, it's the things around that now I get excited by. And my friends I have and, and the people that I love who love me. You know, uh, and, well, as you know, you've met Lynn and she's a very big part of my life. You know, she's wonderful. like, she's, she's made a big difference in my life. I mean. She's the love of my life now. You know, that's it. Uh, you know, you know she, was, she was messaging me when uh, my dad was in hospital when I had COVID and stuff. She was just checking in to see if I was okay. Yeah, she's, she's so lovely. You know, she's, she, she was praying for you. And uh, she's, she's great, you know. Uh, yeah, anyway. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, dad, I mean, hey, look, you're, you know, I, yes, I'll be 79 at the end of this month. I'm, I'm okay. very... I appreciate the fact I'm, I'm still in good health. I'm good. My mind isn't totally gone yet. And, uh, you know, physically I'm good. I walk uh, mostly every day or I stretch or work out or work on my rowing machine, you know, and, and, and Lynn's birthday is two days before mine. So, you know, we, we can celebrate our birthdays together. So I'm, I'm going to be 80 next year, Lindsay. I know you are, darling. I'm looking I'll forward come to over it. And surprise you. <laughs> I'll come over oh, we, and say hello. <laughs> we're already, Lynn and I sit around and we think, hmm, and we talk about the places we've been. Like the other night, I couldn't sleep, but I, I was going through in my mind, thinking, how many beds have Lynn and I slept in in the last <laughs> five years? And I came up with like 25. Wow. That's 25 a lot of different beds. So, you know, it's unusual. But uh, we're already planning to go back, you know, to England. We, you know, we got to, we want to go back. Come and see me. Of course we will. Yes. We'll go out we in London to to... again and have some, some jars and nice old English pubs. Absolutely. <laughs> but we want to go to, we want to go to France because we're, I'm, I'm refreshing my French. I used to be quite, quite fluent. Right. And now I'm teaching, I'm teaching Lynn French. We're having lots of fun, you know. Oh, so it. we'll go to France, we'll go to England, we'll go to Italy. It's all, it's all dreams so far. We just, you know, everybody dreams about going somewhere right now. Yes. <laughs> we, we can, but someday we'll be able to do that. And God, I, I loved being in, in, in London so much. I mean, it was great. And you, you were a big part of that, my dear, you know, making things it's such fun for us, you know. So uh, we want to come back and find another one of those... Um, What's it called? One of those kind of heritage houses. They have a name. The place we stayed at was like a four hundred year old house. Or so. uh, Listed house. No, no. What? There's a. They're, they're all over England. They're, they're. Oh, I can never remember the word. Anyway, yeah, we come. We got to come back and explore. We want to go. I don't well, know next where. Time, next time you come, I'll take you around more of the old city of London, the old like two thousand year old part, and just tell you some little yes. secrets and things. 
Yes. Spooky things. Yes, yes. Find old churches, old galleries. Yes. yes, old. Yes, that'd be fabulous. Hey, Lindsay, it's great to see you, darling. Ah. Yeah. Oh, I got to show you around a little bit. Hold on, don't go. Okay, yeah, 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 do it. I need to Look come. To the That's William Look Shakespeare. The <laughs> yeah. I got a Shakespeare cushion. That's my cat. Okay. Hi, Lindsay. Oh, <laughs> mine's around. Mine's up there asleep, so. There you go. Some of Lynn's work on the wall. That's one I got like 30 years ago. I see it. There we go. Oh, that's Lynn's. Yeah, I recognize that. Yeah. Okay, there's my trumpet. I've been practicing that a lot lately. I didn't know you played the trumpet, Ken. Oh, yeah. Yes, I've been, I've been playing that. That was my first love, actually. When I was 12 years old, I fell in love with the trumpet. And I became obsessed with it. Plants. Oh. That's lovely. Look at all those plants. There's not the bird. There's a little bird house. Not, not a big deal. My bird feeders and that. Look at the old view. It's literally just nature. That's lovely. Yes. There's my pool over there. Two months from now, that'll be open. Come on for oh. a swim. Yeah, I will. Definitely. <laughs> I'll be slamming that pool. Great. Yeah, yeah. This is where I live. All right. Lovely. It's very big. <laughs> You know, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's big oh, it's compared cozy. to cozy. Stuff. I like it. <laughs> I like There's it. stuff everywhere. I don't even mind the stuff everywhere. I like it. There's a watch I just bought a while ago, an ancient watch. Oh, fab. Another work it's of everywhere. Lynn's. Yeah. House of home. It's very homely. Yes, it is indeed, my dear. Yeah. Oh, anyway, there you go. Quick tour. Now we're done. You. All right, my darling. Well, listen. Okay. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it, Ken. It's so lovely oh, it's so to great. see you as well. Great. Great to see you and talk with you, Lindsay. It really is, love. Okay, it yeah. is. And I promise I will come out, because I told you before, my friend Blake lives in Toronto. So That's right. I, yeah, I will, I will see him. I've told you all about Blake. But um, I'll see him, and, and we'll come and see you, and say hello, and have cuddles, and jump in the pool. <laughs> Damn right. Okay, my dear. All right, my lovely. Lots of love to you and Lynn. Yeah, thanks. And you. you a hug. That's me hugging you. You ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Goodbye. All right, my darling. I'll speak to you soon. Yeah. Okay. Bye, darling. Bye. Bye, 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 bye.